Hello. Hi, Hal. <laughs> Hi, Hal. Welcome. Welcome. There we go. Let's try. There we go. Okay. Getting ready to read the beginning of the Nutcracker. <laughs> How's it going? For some reason, it's not wanting to share to share the broadcast on Twitter. It's saying error. I thought it might be a might be character numbers, but I reduced the number of characters and it still wouldn't do it. But anyway, so this. Oh, you managed to share it on Twitter. Maybe it's just my phone's having trouble with the connection down here. That's entirely possible. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> but, oh, it looks backwards. Can you read this? I don't know. Anyway, this is uh, the edition of The Nutcracker, illustrated by Maurice Sendak. And it's my favorite. He did the, um, the set design. Yes, it is forwards. Oh, good because it's backwards to me. <laughs> uh, he designed the sets for a ballet, a Nutcracker ballet in, um, in the early 80s for the Pacific Northwest Ballet, it says. And I just, I love the images that are in the book. It's like, what, what would that performance <laughs> have been like? Concert art, concept art, art for the or ballet. But anyway, shall we get started at the beginning? I'm going to be posting um, posting these on YouTube. So if people miss the first couple chapters, I I will be putting them up so that they can be seen um, later in the week. If people want to listen from the very beginning, there's the illustrations around the table of contents. It's like every page just has beautiful and wonderfully disturbing, in some cases, bits. <laughs> so, The Nutcracker by E.T.A. Hoffman. Introduction. Oh wait, no. That's the introduction by Marie Sendak where he talks about the ballet. There we go. Here is right before right before chapter 1 of the intro pictures welcome welcome i'm just about to read the beginning <laughs> so we've got the nutcracker chapter 1 christmas eve and so we've got godfather drosselmeyer watching there On the 24th of December, Dr. Stahlbaum's children were not allowed to set foot in the small family parlor, much less the adjoining company parlor, not at any time during the day. Fritz and Marie sat huddled together in a corner of the little back room. An eerie feeling came over them when dusk fell, and, as usual on Christmas Eve, no light was brought in. In whispers, Fritz told his younger sister she had just turned seven, that since early morning he had heard murmuring and shuffling and muffled hammer blows in the locked rooms. And a short while before, he confided, a small dark man had crept down the hallway with a big box under his arm. And he, Fritz, felt pretty sure that this could only be Godfather Drosselmeyer. At that, Marie clapped her little hands for joy and cried out, Oh, what do you think Godfather Drosselmeyer has made for us? Judge Drosselmeyer was anything but handsome. He was short and very thin. His face was seamed with wrinkles. He had a big black patch right where his right eye should have been, and he had no hair at all, for which reason he wore a beautiful white wig, a real work of art. And Judge Drosselmeyer was himself a skilled craftsman, able to make and repair clocks. When one of the fine clocks in the Stahlbaum home was sick and unable to sing, Godfather Drosselmeyer would come over, remove his glass wig and yellow coat, and put on a blue apron. For a while he would stick sharp instruments into the clock. Little Marie felt real pain at the sight, but it didn't hurt the clock in the least. On the contrary, it came back to life and made everyone happy by whirring and striking and singing merrily. Whenever he came, he had something in his pocket for the children. 
Now a little man who would roll his eyes and bow in a most comical way. Now a little box with a little bird at a, now a box that a little bird would hop out of. Now something else. But every year at Christmas he took great pains to turn out a work of wonderful artistry so precious that the children's parents always put it away in a safe place. Oh, Marie cried out, what do you think God Dross Godfather Drosselmeyer has made for us? Fritz said it was sure to be a fortress, with all kinds of soldiers marching up and down and drilling, and then other soldiers would come and try to get in, but the brave defenders would fire their guns, which would boom and thunder wonderfully. No, no, Marie interrupted. Godfather Drosselmeyer said something to me about a beautiful garden with a big lake in it, and lovely swans with golden necklaces swimming around on it and singing the most beautiful songs. And then a little girl comes from the garden to the lake and calls the swans and feeds them marzipan. Swans don't eat marzipan, said Fritz rather rudely. And besides, Godfather Drosselmeyer can't make a whole garden. And anyway, what good are his toys to us? They always get taken away before we know it. I like the things Mom and Papa give us a lot better, because we can keep them and do what we like with them. Then the children tried to guess what their parents would give them this time. Marie marked that Mistress Trude, her big doll, had changed for the worse. Clumsier than ever, she kept falling on the floor, which always left nasty marks on her face. And no amount of scolding would help. She just couldn't keep her clothes clean. Marie also remembered how Mama had smiled at her for being so delighted with her doll, Gretchen's little parasol. Fritz, on the other hand, observed that, as his father was well aware, a decent chestnut horse was needed for his royal stables, and that his army, ha his army had no cavalry at all. So the children knew that their parents had bought them all sorts of lovely presents, and were busy imagining them, but they were just as certain that the Christ child was looking on with tender loving eyes, and that Christmas gifts, because he had blessed them, gave more pleasure than any others. The children who kept whispering about the presents they expected, were reminded of this by their elder sister Louise, who added that it was always the Christ child who, by the hands of their dear parents, bought, brought children things that would give them true enjoyment, since he knew what those would be better than the children's themselves. So big sister Louise went on. Instead of hoping and wishing for all sorts of things, they should wait quietly like well-behaved children for whatever the Christ child would bring. Marie sat deep in thought. But Fritz muttered, All the same, I'd like a chestnut horse and some hussars. By then it was very dark. Fritz and Marie pressed close together, afraid to say another word. They had a feeling that gentle wings were passing over, and they seemed to hear beautiful music in the distance. When a flash of brightness flitted across the wall, they knew it was the Christ child flying away on glowing clouds to other happy children. At that moment, a silvery bright bell rang ding-a-ling. The doors flew open, and such a flood of light streamed in from the big parlor that the children cried aloud, Oh! Oh! and stood stock still on the threshold. Papa and Mama appeared in the doorway, took their children by the hand, and said, Come in. Come in, dear children, and see what the Christ child has brought you. And there's an illustration of the parlor. I'm wondering if maybe I should turn the phone sideways to do the big spreads of the pictures better. So for those of you who just turn, tuned in, this is the Nutcracker. We're going on to Chapter 2. The children have just been led into the parlor. Chapter 2. The Presents. We like presents. <laughs> kind reader or listener. Fritz, Theodore, Ernest, or whatever your name may be, I must ask you to think as hard as you can of your last Christmas table piled high with gifts. Then perhaps you will be able to conjure up the scene, how the children stood silent with shining eyes, and how after quite some time Marie heaved a sigh and cried out, Oh, how lovely! Oh, how lovely! And Fritz took two or three rather spectacular jumps into the air. The children must have been especially well-behaved that year, for they had never before received so many splendid presents. The big Christmas tree in the middle of the room was decorated with any number of gold and silver apples and sugared almonds, bright-colored candles, and goodies of all kinds shaped like buds and blossoms hung from every branch. But the most startling thing about this wonderful tree 
was that hundreds of tapers glittered like stars in its dark branches, and the tree itself, shining with an inner light, invited the children to pick its blossoms and fruits. Round about the tree everything glittered splendidly. No one could even have described all those wonderful things. Marie discovered the prettiest dolls and all sorts of shiny little utensils. Best of all, a little silk dress, decorated with color ribbons, had been hung up in such a way that she could examine it from all sides. And examine it she did, crying out time after time, Oh, what a beautiful! Oh, what a lovely dress! And I know, I know for sure that I'll be allowed to put it on. Meanwhile, Fritz galloped around the table three or four times, trying out the new horse that, true enough, he had found already bridled on the table. On dismounting, he remarked that the beast was rather wild, but it didn't matter. He'd break him in. Then he reviewed his new squadron of hussars, who were admirably fitted out in red and gold uniforms, with silver sables and sabres and mounts so gleaming white that they, too, seemed to be of pure silver. When the children had calmed down a little, they got ready to look at the picture books that lay open, showing all sorts of beautiful flowers and people clothed in many colors and dear little children at play, all painted to look as natural as if they were really alive and talking. Well, the children were just getting ready to look at these wonderful books when the bell rang again. Knowing that Godfather Drosselmeyer would be unveiling his present, they ran to the table that had been set up beside the wall. The screen that had hidden it was taken away, and what did the children see? On a green lawn, bright with flowers, stood a magnificent castle with dozens of sparkling windows and golden towers. Chimes were playing, doors and windows opened, and tiny but shapely ladies and gentlemen wearing long dresses and plumed hats could be seen strolling around the rooms. In the central hall the silver chandeliers had so many candles in them that they seemed to be all afire, and children in little skirts and doublets were dancing to the music of the chimes. A man in an emerald green cloak kept appearing at one of the windows, waving his hand and vanishing and Godfather Drosselmeyer himself, who was hardly bigger than Papa's thumb, would come out from time to time and stand at the castle gate for a while and go back in again. Bracing his arm, arms on the table, Fritz looked for a while at the beautiful castle and at the dancing and walking figures. Then he said, Godfather Drosselmeyer, let me go inside your castle. Impossible, said the judge. And he was right, for it was foolish of Fritz to think of going into a castle that Golden Towers and all was not as high as himself. This Fritz understood, but after a while, when the ladies and gentlemen continued to stroll back and forth, the children to dance, the emerald green man to appear at the same window, and Godfather Drosselmeyer to step outside the door, Fritz said impatiently, Godfather Drosselmeyer, come out of the other door next time. That's not possible, dear Fritz, said the judge. Then, said Fritz, make that green man who keeps coming to the window walk around with the others. That, too, is impossible, said the judge. Then make the children come out, cried Fritz. I want to look at them close up. No, 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 all those things are impossible, said the judge crossly. That's how the mechanism works, and it can't be changed. Is that right, said Fritz, with an affected drawl. It can't be changed, can it? In that case, Godfather Drosselmeyer, if all your precious little people in the castle can do is the same thing over and over again, they don't amount to much, and I don't really care for them. Give me my hussars. They march backwards and forwards as I command, and they're not shut up in a house. With that, he ran back to the Christmas table, and made his squadrons trot this way and that on their silver horses, wheel about, charge, and fire their guns to his heart's content. Marie also quietly crept away, for she, too, had soon tired of watching the dolls strolling and dancing about inside the castle, although, as she was a good, well-behaved child, she hadn't wanted to show it. Judge Drosselmeyer said rather crossly to the children's parents, A work of art like this isn't meant for ignorant children. I'm just going to pack my castle up again. But Mr. Stahlbaum, Mrs. Stahlbaum came over and got him to show her the ingenious clockwork that moved the little figures, which meant taking the whole castle apart and putting it back together again. That cheered him up, and he gave the children some lovely brown men and women with gold faces, hands, and legs. They smelled as fragrant as gingerbread, and Fritz and Marie were delighted with them. Sister Louise had been given a lovely dress, which she put on when her mother asked her to, and she looked very pretty in it. But when Marie was asked to put on hers, she said she'd rather just look at it for a while, and she was allowed to do so. I'll read one more chapter on this, on this episode one of The Nutcracker, and then we'll go about 
chap the next chapter is Marie's favorite. The real reason why Marie didn't want to leave the Christmas table was that she had just caught sight of something she hadn't noticed before. Fritz's hussars had been parading near the tree. When they marched away, an excellent little man came into view. He stood there quietly, as though patiently waiting his turn. One might have found fault with his build. His torso was too long and stout for his short, skinny legs, and his head was much too big for the rest of him. But to make up for these disadvantages, the distinction of his dress showed him to be a man of taste and breeding. He was wearing a well-cut lavender hussar's jacket, with lots of white frogging and buttons, breeches of the same stuff, and the daintiest little boots that had ever graced the feet of a student or even an officer. They were molded as neatly to his dainty little legs as if they had been painted on. Oddly enough, though, in view of these fine clothes, he had, hanging from his shoulders, a skimpy, ungainly cloak that looked almost as if it were made of wood, and he was wearing what appeared to be a miner's cap. But Marie remembered that Godfather Drossemeyer often wore a wretched-looking morning coat and a hideous cap, neither of which prevented him from being a dear, sweet godfather, and it also occurred to Marie... It also occurred to Marie that even if Godfather Drossemeyer were to dress as prettily as this little man, he wouldn't be as handsome. When With Marie, it was love at first sight, and the longer she gazed at the sweet little man, the more delighted she was with his good-natured face. His light green, slightly too prominent eyes were also full of kindness, and his well-curled white cotton beard was most becoming, as it brought out the sweet smile of his bright red lips. Oh, father, dear, Marie cried out, who does the dear little man by the tree belong to? Dear child, said Dr. Stahlbaum, our friend here will serve you all well. He will crack hard nuts for all of you with his teeth, and he belongs to Louise as much as to you and Fritz. Carefully picking him up from the table, Dr. Stahlbaum lifted his wooden cloak, whereupon the little man opened his mouth wide, revealing two rows of sharp white teeth. At her father's bidding, Marie put in a nut, and crack! The little man bit it in two. The shell fell down, and Marie found the sweet kernel in her hand. Dr. Stahlbaum told the children that the pretty little man was descended from the Nutcracker family, and practiced the trade of his forebears. Marie cried out for joy, and her father said, Well, dear Marie, since you seem so fond of friend Nutcracker, he shall be entrusted to your special care. Though, as I've already told you, Louise and Fritz have as much right to make use of him as you. Marie picked him up and gave him nuts to crack, but she chose the smallest so the little man wouldn't have to open his mouth too wide, which did not really become him. Louise joined her, and friend Nutcracker had to work for, bo for them both. He seemed glad to do it, for he kept smiling in the friendliest way. By that time, Fritz was tired of riding and maneuvering. Hearing the sound of nuts being cracked, he ran over to his sisters and laughed heartily at the droll little man. After that, Fritz, too, wanted to eat nuts. Nutcracker passed from hand to hand, and never stopped opening and closing his mouth. Fritz always chose the biggest and hardest nuts. And all of a sudden, crack, crack! Three little teeth fell out of Nutcracker's mouth, and his lower jaw began to wobble. Oh, my poor little Nutcracker, Marie cried, taking him out of Fritz's hand. He's just a stupid fool, said Fritz. Calls himself a Nutcracker, and his teeth are no good. He doesn't even know his trade, if you ask me. Give him to me, Marie. Let him crack nuts for me, even if he loses the rest of his teeth and his jaw drops off, too. Who cares about a good-for-nothing like him? Marie was in tears. No, no, she cried. He's my dear nutcracker, and you can't have him. See the sad way he's looking at me and showing me his sore little mouth? You're a heartless brute. You beat your horses, and you even had one of your soldiers shot. That's the way it has to be, said Fritz. You don't understand these things. And the nutcracker belongs to me as much as to you, so hand him over. Sobbing, Marie wrapped the wounded nutcracker in her little handkerchief. The children's parents came over with Godfather Drossemeyer, who, to Marie's dismay, sided with Fritz. But Dr. Stahlbaum said, I expressly entrusted nutcracker to Marie's care, which is obviously just what he needs. So there's no point in arguing. She and no one else is in charge of him. What's more, I'm very much surprised at Fritz making demands on a man wounded in the line of duty. As a good soldier, he should know that wounded men are never expected to do active service. Fritz felt deeply ashamed. Losing all interest in nuts and nutcrackers, he slunk away to the other side of the table, where, after posting the necessary sentries, he sent his hussars into night quarters. Marie collected nutcrackers' lost teeth and bandaged his wounded mouth with a pretty white ribbon she had taken from her dress. 
She rocked the poor little fellow, who was looking extremely pale and shaken, in her arms like a baby, meanwhile looking at the pretty pictures of the new picture books that lay there along with the other presents. She grew very angry, which was not at all like her, when Godfather Drosselmeyer laughed at her and kept asking why she was making such a fuss over such an ugly fellow. Remembering the strange resemblance between Nutcracker and Drosselmeyer, which had struck her at first sight of the little man, she said very gravely, "'I'm not at all sure, dear Godfather, that if you were dressed like my dear Nutcracker and were not wearing such shiny boots, I'm not at all sure that you'd look as handsome as he does.' Marie didn't know why her parents laughed so heartily, or why the judge went red in his face and hardly laughed at all. There may have been some special reason. So there's the end of that chapter. The Nutcracker has short chapters, which, make, which makes it good for reading, for reading in groups. So, for those of you who turned in part way, I was reading... Uh, E.T.A. Hoffman's Nutcracker. This is the edition. Oh, you're very welcome, Hal. You're very welcome. Uh, this is the edition illustrated by Maurice Sendak. So I'll be reading uh, the rest of the Nutcracker over the course of the week. And maybe even ending on Christmas, <laughs> which would be fun. So I'll be posting these videos to YouTube afterwards. Uh, the Periscope videos. Thank you very much for tuning in, and until the next one. <laughs> welcome, welcome, and happy holidays. <laughs>